The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning, uh, all of you. Welcome to this uh, webinar uh, to present and launch the Future of Petrochemicals uh, report from the IA. We are uh, ready uh, to get started, but we'd like to hold uh, for a couple of minutes to allow for more stakeholders and colleagues to, to join the, the launch webinar as well. So if you could please hold with us uh, for a couple of minutes, we'll get uh, started very shortly. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, we will start the session on uh, the future of petrochemicals, which the International Ag Energy Agency just produced. My name is Michtel Wurstorfer. I'm the new director for, uh, the D uh, for IA on the sustainability technology and outlook. So, and I'm here with the authors of the report, which is Araceli fernandez Fales. Peter Levi and Tai Yun Kim, and we are all together now for you to present, and at the end of the presentation also be available for question and answers. So I will start with a few slides to, to give the background of the IEA. As you know, the International Energy Agency is an autonomous organization that works around the world, and it's there to support accelerated clean energy transitions with unparalleled data, rigorous analysis, and a real-world solution. So this is a well-known uh, feature for the IEA. We have also in our mission today three further core priorities where we are working on, which is the economic development. That means supporting free markets to foster economic growth and eliminate energy poverty globally. The second one being environmental awareness. So analyzing policy options to offset the impact of energy production and use on the environment, especially for tackling climate change and air pollution, which is also a relevant theme in this particular report. And then engagement worldwide, working closely with partner countries, especially with emerging economies, to find solutions to shared energy and environmental concerns. So the whole IEA global family includes now 30 member states or member countries, as well as associations and partner countries with which is working closely on this area. The IEA also then engages with num numerous countries around the globe to collect energy data and information. So you can see it 
on the last slide in which countries the members, the partners, the association, and the data coverage. For today, you will see that the IEA launched last year, in fact, what we call the Future of Series, which in 2017, and the main objective is to look for what we call key blind spots in global energy. These are mainly areas which are important uh, for the energy system, but in our view, they don't get enough attention as they deserve. Uh, given that they have a few future or a current important role to play in the energy system and in the economy. So we started with these series in 2017 and we have already published relatively recently a publication on the future of trucks, which was presented last year. Then one on cooling, focusing on air conditioning, and now, as you will see, the future of petrochemicals, which we also thought is a real important area where we haven't had enough thought or data or which is worth now and will be presented in this report today. With that, I pass the floor to Araceli. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, I just wanted to thank um, all the different colleagues uh, from the IA that participated in this in this piece of analysis over the last year, beyond the, the three colleagues that we will present in today. Many of them uh, participated but couldn't uh, join us today. And also as well, all the different stakeholders that have been supporting our work through different meetings, workshops, webinars, and uh, different engagement opportunities, uh, as well as information. So the, the first uh, part of the, of the webinar is going to focus on putting the petrochemical sector uh, in context today uh, related to how basically the, it interacts with society, with the energy system, and as well with, with the environment. So petrochemical products are all around us, uh, from the everyday items to components of transportation and infrastructure, our modern society is highly dependent on petrochemicals. Things that you find around uh, home and office, uh, many personal items such as toiletries, medical equipment, digital devices, and clothing. Also many building materials such as uh, PVC plastic pipes and windows. Products that are integral to our food supply are also um, integrated or related to petrochemical products. Uh, for instance, around half of the world's uh, food production is facilitated by synthetic nitrogen fertilizers nearly all of which are made of, uh, of from oil and gas. Beyond the production phase, the world is consuming increasing quantities of plastic packaging as well. And uh, for instance, it was recently estimated that around 1 million bottles uh, of plastic uh, are consumed every minute. Many elements of the transportation system uh, also rely on petrochemical products, tires, batteries, Many other vehicle components are also made of synthetic rubber and plastic. Petrochemicals uh, will also um, have or be instrumental um, in developing many of the advanced materials that will support the energy transition, such as those using wind turbine blades or uh, solar panels. But despite these products being all around us, uh, the petrochemical sector is one of the key blind spots in the global energy system, as, as Mechtel was highlighting before. And this publication, like others before that have been mentioned within this series, are really trying to shed light on, on these uh, topics that deserve more attention, uh, but haven't uh, been paid uh, that level of, of uh, let's say, analytical attention yet. Petrochemicals have been growing fast. Um, until the millennium, several back materials, such as aluminum, cement, grew broadly in line with GDP. China's growth after the millennium led to an accelerating demand for these materials to fuel a wave of construction and infrastructure projects and support a growing manufacturing base. Plastics, which is a key product, um, a key group of products um, uh, related to petrochemicals uh, demand, had grown faster than any other uh, group of bulk materials. Production volumes have increased more than tenfold since 1970, and demand has more than doubled since the millennium. This is explained by the fact that since the, mid since the middle of the last century, plastics have become 
associative um, for several other traditional materials, particularly in the packaging, automotive, and construction and use sectors. As we were discussing before, quite ingrained in our um, society today. This is also because plastics are often cheaper and the versatility means that they can offer highly tailored material properties for a given application. If we stick with plastics and uh, look a bit in more detail to this segment of demand, this group of materials will continue to be a key demand driver uh, for the sector. Advanced economies such as the United States, Canada, Korea consume up to 20 times as much plastic as developing economies such as India and many countries in Africa. Plastic demand is driven in part by domestic manufacturing industry, but also by export markets. For instance, in, in 2016, Saudi Arabia and the United States were the largest exporters of polyethylene, a key plastic resin used across a range of products and industries. So with this, uh, with this context um, uh, of expected uh, growth, um, the petrochemical sector, when we look at how it's um, linked to the energy system, is the largest industrial user of oil and gas. They account uh, petrochemicals today for 14% of global oil demand, ranking second behind transport. Also in terms of gas, petrochemicals currently represent 8% of the gas demand globally. Half of the chemical sector uh, uh, today, energy uh, total energy inputs uh, relate to feedstock. So half of the total energy inputs uh, that go into this specific sector are related to fuels that are used as material inputs to conform the final product. From this, more than 90% come from oil and gas. So in this diagram, uh, we're showing how oil, gas, but also coal are used as raw materials to produce different primary chemicals that are then converted into farther downstream chemical commodities and ultimately consumer goods such as fertilizers, plastics, rubber, etc. Oil is the predominant feedstock for what we call high value chemicals, which are the main precursors of uh, plastic that you can see as uh, dark blue in the diagram, whereas gas and coal are used uh, typically for ammonia and methanol. Altogether, high-value chemicals, ammonia and methanol, account for around two-thirds of the total energy demand uh, that goes into the chemical sector. If we look at uh, some of the regional differences and how the petrochemical industry is distributed across regions, we can really say that no one size fits for all. Asia Pacific, particularly China, dominates global primary chemical production, accounting for half of the world um, complete output. Uh, Europe, North America, and the Middle East are also important regions, together accounting for most of the rest. If you look at how primary chemical production translates into feedstock use, then we can also see that there are significant differences across regions um, with the different uh, sources of, um, of feedstock being used uh, to produce those, those chemicals. If we focus now in the four key regions in terms of size, North America, Europe, Middle East, and Asia Pacific, then we can see that along with the Middle East, uh, the United States has a um, feedstock advantage in its access to low cost ethane, owing to its abundant natural gas supplies and the shale revolution. In contrast, Asia Pacific and also Europe rely predominantly on naphtha, where the spread between the prices of natural gas liquids and crude is large. This puts these regions at a feedstock disadvantage. China constitutes a key outlier in its choice of feedstock for ammonia and methanol production, which is uh, the use of coal. And around a quarter of primary chemical production uh, from Asia Pacific and specifically China is based on, on coal. These differences that we described in terms of the feedstock choices to produce these levels of primary chemicals are own in part to these regional uh, cost um, differences as well. Um, Different choices on feedstock across regions are a reflection of the big contribution of feedstock costs to production costs, as well as the differences that, we, that are observed in feedstock availability at an advantageous cost. In this slide, we are displaying the simplified levelized cost of high-value chemicals that include ethylene, propylene, and aromatics for different feedstocks and across different regions. The Middle East and the US remain the regions where producing these commodities from ethane is more advantageous whereas naphtha-based production is less economical but dominant in other regions due to their limited access to lighter feedstock. The feedstock choice doesn't not only impact costs uh, but also process yields, 
or the amount, uh, said in other words, the amount that of product that can be obtained per unit of feedstock being consumed. Typically, higher overall yields are obtained at the expense of a balanced product profile. While Ethan offers the higher yields uh, on a person of high value chemical products, among other feedstock options for steam cracking, it delivers at the same time a mix of high value chemicals containing around 80% of ethylene, which means that uh, the final mix of products will be more rich in ethylene and then other options would or might be needed to really compensate for that distribution of products. I'm going to make a, a stop here and uh, we are going to discuss a little bit what are the interactions and the impacts uh, from the oil supply side of things at this point. And I'm going to give the floor to my colleague uh, Taijin Kim, uh, which has been also uh, participating and collaborating in this project. Thanks, Terry. With growing demand for petrochemical products, oil companies, especially the refining industry, are increasingly expanding the petrochemical business through refining petrochemical integration. The current interest in petrochemical integration reflects a preoccupation in the refining industry to seek out higher and resilient sources of income. Higher, in recent years, margins from selling transport fuels such as gasoline and diesel are narrowing down and selling petrochemical pieces stock is not very profitable for companies. However, as shown in the chart, producing petrochemicals can offer better margins than pures, offering a better chance for companies to raise profitability. And resilient, while oil demand for other sectors is increasingly challenged by a combination of efficiency improvement, pure switching, and electrification, uh, demand prospects for, for petrochemicals remain relatively robust. Petrochemicals can also provide a good hedge against the risks of a possible construction of oil demand in a low carbon scenario, such as the clean technology scenario, which explains one of the motivations behind the recent expansion. And the refining petrochemical integration can also offer some other operational additional benefits. However, the level and types of integration vary widely by region. For example, in the United States and the Middle East, where there are readily available supply of NGS, the, the direct upstream to petrochemical route is a prevailing option. This is more like a business integration. Many oil companies who produce NGS have also invested in chemical production facilities, but there's no operational overlap between facilities. In other regions, where availability of NGS is, is limited, the case for operational integration is strong. China is an interesting example in this regard. China has the highest level of refining petrochemical integration globally. Many of the refining and petrochemical facilities are sitting next to each other or are closely integrated. And in China, there are also an interesting example of so-called reverse integration, where petrochemical companies are moving upstream rather than refinery moving downstream. And there are even more ambitious schemes being pursued in the Middle East to bypass the refining operation entirely and produce chemicals directly from the crude oil. Saudi Aramco and Sabic recently announced a large-scale crude oil to chemical project of 400,000 barrels per day capacity. It is also developing a more ambitious scheme aiming 70-80% of chemical yield. Whatever levels of types of integration there are, what is sure is that the role of oil companies in the petrochemical sector is set to increase over time. Petrochemicals can also take an environmental toll. The chemical sector is the largest industrial energy consumer, ahead of iron and steel and cement. It accounts for around 10% of total final energy consumption and almost 30% of industrial final energy consumption. However, the sector is only the third largest source of industrial CO2 emissions. This is because the more than half of its energy input is used as feedstock, then therefore locked into production. <coughs> there are two takeaways from this picture. First, although Feedstock input do not contribute to increase in CO2 emissions as they are locked into product. There is still a chance for these emissions to be released 
during the use of certain chemical product. So effective management of plastic waste or fertilizer waste is very much important to avoid any environmentally negative impact. And second, although the, the sector is the third largest, still the sector emits around 1.5 gigaton of CO2 per year, or 18% of industrial CO2 emissions. Reducing these emissions is critical to minimize the sector's environmental toll on the economy. Thank you very much, Tejan. Um, so with that, we are going to enter into the next section of the, of the presentation, which is uh, basically to go from the, the current situation to uh, starting exploring uh, different futures. Uh, the first uh, section relates to the exploration of the what we call the reference technology scenario, which is basically what the current trajectory for the petrochemical sector sector would be. Um, starting with with demand, uh, we expect demand for plastics. Uh, one of the key demand drivers for the petrochemical sector, as we've as we've outlined, to remain uh, relatively robust. With production for key thermoplastics more than doubling between 2020, uh, 2010 and 2050, especially as developing countries increase their population and wealth, these materials will be increasingly demanded, particularly for packaging and construction. On a per capita basis, the demand for these plastics increases by more than 50%. And uh, to complement the analysis, uh, we've also um, undertaken um, or developed a high demand variant, um, basically to perform some sensitivity analysis around the impacts that different levels of demand could have in terms of technology choices, but also in terms of um, energy, energy demand. And that um, high demand variant, uh, the results around that will be also available uh, on the website uh, very shortly. In our base scenario, all demand growth is fueled for, by four key drivers. Um, shipping, aviation, road freight, and the largest being petrochemicals. Oil demand rises uh, around 10 uh, million barrels per day by 2030 globally, and we expect that uh, from that uh, uh, sorry, petrochemicals uh, certainly will be the main contributor with um, more than one third uh, to, that, uh, to that increase and uh, increasing uh, or representing more than half of the growth that we expect by 2050. Looking at, again, uh, what the uh, regional impact um, of this expected growth would be in terms of where the main producing, um, uh, let's say, centers uh, would be, um, China and the U.S. see the largest near-term capacity addition as a result of a feedstock advantage, as we've discussed, and a strong source of domestic demand, especially in the case of China. Uh, whereas in terms of long-term growth, um, that would be led by Asia, particularly China, and also the Middle East. By 2050, Asia-Pacific uh, retains still its position uh, of the world's largest uh, chemical-producing region by far. And uh, I would like to note here that in this, in this diagram shown, the graph that relates to the Asia-Pacific region, which is shown in, in red, uh, with a red label uh, on the right, uh, has a different scale which, which really in, than the rest of the graphs, which really indicates the different um, order of magnitude in terms of the size compared to, to other regions. Um, again, translating these this, uh, levels of, of production or, or capacity additions in this case to feedstock um, and focusing on the, on the key four regions um, that we've been uh, highlighting. Um, then we can see that uh, in terms of high-value chemicals, again, the main precursors for plastics, ethane feedstock, um, uh, the consumption of ethane feedstock for high-value chemicals uh, will grow um, by 70% by 2030 in favor regions, um, which basically are uh, ethane being displayed in, in light blue in the, in the graph. This is in part due to uh, demand for exports to other regions, such as Europe, uh, but, uh, however, in regions where continuing strong growth uh, in the long term, um, or, or the, the growth will continue strongly uh, in the long term, then those regions will rely mostly on, on NAFTA. And that is mainly related to the fact that ethan supply uh, tightens as a result of flattening natural gas liquids outputs uh, from the U.S. shale. Um, and also we expect uh, an stagnation of title production in the second half of the, of the 2020s. In the analysis in the report, you would also see that we've done 
a specific um, assessment looking at uh, whether these considerations around the availability of, of ethane um, um, would be more optimistic and what would be the impact as well. And, and certainly, I mean, the trigger for this was the, the appetite of the petrochemical industry for, for light feedstock for sure. Um, uh, looking at ammonia um, as another example within the primary chemical production, then natural gas um, still um, remains the, the, the major feedstock uh, and it really absorbs the majority of the growth in terms of uh, new capacity additions uh, that we see. Um, in dark blue, you can see the use of coal, uh, especially in, in China, which is shown in the Asia Pacific graph. And as you can see, this stagnates over time with the capacity addition being based, in, being based on, on gas. And with that, we are going to start the section around the alternative um, future that we've also explored. And I'm going to give the, the floor to my colleague Peter Levi, that also participated uh, very intensively in the report and is one of the co-authors. Thank you, Araceli. And, and as Araceli has said there, I'm going to go through an alternative, uh, more sustainable pathway that the petrochemical sector can uh, can follow. And we call this the clean technology scenario or the CTS. Relative to the base scenario, the reference technology scenario or RTS, the CTS is, is quite a different uh, approach that we take. Um, instead of projecting forward current trends, we work backwards from where we want to get to. Um, and where we want to get to is a more sustainable chemical industry, um, one that can continue supplying its products to the world whilst addressing several environmental challenges, including aspects of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Sorry. Um, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, some of them are more obviously relevant to the IEA, SDG 7 concerning renewable energy and SDG 13, of climate action are obvious ones uh, for us to consider in our analyses, given uh, our remit in energy and the uh, energy sector accounting for the majority of uh, anthropogenic CO2 <coughs> emissions. But we also wanted to cast the net a bit wider, uh, following the principles uh, of the IEA's sustainable development scenario and adopt a broader definition of sustainability. In this analysis, that translates into the consideration of air pollutants, water pollutants, and water demand. Sorry. <laughs> Um, and in the uh, clean technology scenario, these uh, environmental impacts uh, dramatically decrease. Air pollution decreases by around 85%, water pollutants by more than 90%, and CO2 emissions are 45% lower than they are today. Uh, the next few slides take a closer look at this scenario and what needs to be done to facilitate these uh, obvious environmental benefits. So the first element of context to look at in the CTS is demand for primary chemicals and the role of recycling uh, in reducing the, the demand for virgin production. Um, demand, demand for plastics can be satisfied either by pr uh, primary production um, through oil and gas uh, or by recycling and reusing plastic products uh, found in waste streams, a so-called secondary production. The purple bars on this graph uh, and the gray one for 2017 um, show the amount of uh, plastic produced uh, by secondary production um, in the CTS. Um, the blue bars show the RTS values. Um, the red dots show that the average uh, resin recycling rates for all resins globally and the ranges within those for each region. Um, and finally, the green bars on the right show the primary chemical savings that are derived from this dramatic increase in recycling that takes place in the CTS. Collection rates in the CTS for plastic recycling more than triple between 2017 and 2050, sorry, nearly triple between 2017 and 2050. And this results in around 70 million tons of primary chemical savings, um, or around half of today's plastic production being taken place by uh, via secondary routes. So having touched on this uh, demand context and recycling, I wanted to just pass back to Taeyun to go through the broader context of oil demand in the CTS. Thanks, Peter. Plastic recycling has also impact on oil demand for petrochemical feedstock. Higher recycling in the CTS reduced oil demand for feedstock by around 2.4 million barrels per day by 2050. However, even with this reduction, oil demand for chemical feedstock still grows by 3.6 million barrels per day in this scenario by 2050. 
In fact, the share of chemical feed stock in total oil demand in the CTS is much higher than in the RTS. This is because oil demand for other sectors such as transport decreased quite a lot in this scenario, while petrochemicals keep on growing. So by 2050, petrochemicals account for almost 26% of global total, much higher than the 16% in the RTS. This changing sectoral oil demand prospect also have an impact on the composition of demand for individual oil product. In this scenario, there is a visible shift of demand toward the right product, such as NAFSA or LPG. This poses challenges for refiners. Meeting this new demand pattern is not easy because many of the refining facilities are equipped to produce a broad range of product, not just the right product. Maybe processing more lighter crude could be a starting point to address this challenge. And a deeper refining and petrochemical integration can gain more prominence in this type of scenario. Crude oil to chemical projects is an example of a technology that may be adopted more in this context. Let me just reinforce the new oil demand dynamics with an interesting finding from our GTS analysis. Here, we have some regional per capita figure for oil demand for load passenger transport and for plastic consumption. Today, in the United States and the European Union, per capita oil demand for load passenger transport is between two to five times as much as for plastic consumption. In China and India, the ratio is smaller, but still load passenger transport still eclipses plastic consumption. An interesting feature of the CTS is in all these regions, per capita oil demand for plastic consumption overtakes that for passenger transport by 2050. Petrochemicals therefore becomes the largest sector of oil demand by 2050 in this scenario. This contrasting pattern, growing plastic demand on the one hand and declining transport demand on the other hand, does not work well with today's refining business model. Refiners used to earn profit by selling transport fuels, and in many cases, they make losses by selling petrochemical feedstock. However, this traditional pattern may not hold in this type of scenario, requiring refiners to find a new operational model in a new market environment. Now, my colleague Peter will explain some of the possible measures to reduce emissions in the chemical sector. Thanks, Dane. So despite the continuing uh, oil growth uh, that Taeyun outlined there, um, emissions declined by about 45% in the CTS by 2050 relative to today's levels. And this represents a 60% decline relative to the RTS in 2050 or a 25% cumulative reduction over the analysis period. How can oil demand keep rising while emissions undergo rapid declines? I might hear you ask. <laughs> one, one reason is the consumption of oil as feedstock, um, as Araceli outlined in the first section. Molecules of oil and gas become embedded in the chemical products and are released either downstream or embedded more permanently. The remainder of the emissions reductions that are achieved in the RTS um, are done so via a variety of leaders, levers. Sorry, I've got a few. I'll now provide a, an overview of these, of the main uh, categories of these. We've grouped the emissions reductions that take place in the CTS under five categories. CTUS, coal to natural gas feedstock shifts, energy efficiency, plastic recycling, and the use of alternative feedstocks. CTUS does the heavy lifting in the, in the, on the emissions front, and the chemical sector, this is because the chemical sector represents some of the lowest cost options for CTUS in the energy system, and it's hard for alternative feedstocks such as bioenergy and renewable hydrogen to compete with this technology in most regions. Energy efficiency, both from a continuous process energy intensity improvement point of view, and because of shifts to fundamentally more efficient process routes, this lever delivers around a quarter of emission savings in the CTS relative to the RTS. Coal to get natural gas feedstock shifts account for another quarter, uh, and this mainly relates to the large coal-based chemical industry in China, 
which continues to evolve in the RTS, but is uh, dramatically uh, shifted towards gas and uh, some CTS in the in the CTS. Ambitious increases in recycling deliver comparatively few savings, but are still an important component of the CTS for other reasons that I'll come back to in a, in a couple of slides' time. Um, and just to highlight that, of course, more details, much more details, all of these levers can be found uh, in the report. Just to zoom in on the uh, CCUS context, um, the chemical sector hosts some of the well hosts the largest CCU application in the world by far at the moment, which is uh, um, CO2 being used as a feedstock for urea, and this CO2 is usually sourced from the concentrated CO2 streams that leave ammonia uh, production facilities. And um, while this only represents a temporary uh, storage of CO2 as it's released when urea decomposes in the agriculture sector, it's still an important consideration in the modeling because we need to take account of that CO2 that can no longer be captured for permanent storage in the current structure. By 2050 though, capture for permanent storage overtakes CCU uh, with around 220 megatons of CO2 being captured annually from a mixture of concentrated and dilute streams. Um, this, together with the utilized emissions, means that around 35% of emissions generated in the sector are being either captured or utilized uh, in the CTS by 2050. Now I wanted to come to one of the key environmental problems that um, is garnering a lot of attention around the world at the moment, and that's uh, plastic waste leakage into the world's seas and oceans. Um, this graph shows the cumulative and annual plastic waste leakage in each of our scenarios. Um, and just to provide a bit of background on this topic for those of you who are um, interested. When disposed of improperly, plastic products can, uh, and, they, and they do currently make their way into waterways and eventually into the ocean. When they are broken down into small plastics by uh, small microplastics by sunlight, uh, many fish and other animals can uh, mistake them for food and ingest them. In the RTS, in our base scenario, with no firm and globally coordinated commitments, to reform poor or non-existent waste management practices in many countries, cumulative volumes of plastic waste in the world's ocean increase a tenfold. And, and this tracks the growth in, in plastic production. In the CTS, however, the rapid and broad-based improvements across the globe in waste management to facilitate a near tripling in recycling collection rates, and this lays the groundwork for more than halving cumulative ocean-bound plastic waste relative to the RTS. And um, this does not take into account any uh, efforts to remove plastic waste from the ocean once it has um, entered, um, many of which are currently being looked at and will likely be needed to complement these efforts in the future. Now we'd like to look at uh, the investment side of the coin for the CTS. Um, and our analysis of, of this topic um, was focused on primary chemical production, and it shows that the CTS can be pursued cost effectively from a cost effectively from an investment standpoint. Um, recycling and coal to gas feedstock shifts are two components that uh, pr for provide savings in the CTS. Um, this, this recycling because uh, lower levels of primary chemical production avoid the need for the construction of several expensive steam crackers and other equipment in the sector. Um, and then processes that utilize a lighter feedstock than coal, not a solid feedstock, tend to be less capital intensive. Um, these, bo both of these uh, aspects of the scenario uh, provide savings that more than offset the uh, added investments needed for carbon capture and uh, alternative feedstock uh, processing equipment. Overall, the cumulative investment in the CTS is around 200 billion less than in the RTS. And now I'd like to move to a, an analysis uh, that we did on the side of the CTS, and we call it from beyond the CTS, but it's, it's not part of our scenario, uh, scenario results. Um, and it's more of a what-if analysis that we performed for primary chemical production. So if uh, we wanted to ask whether if feedstocks were produced from a carbon neutral energy source, um, what would the benefits be? And uh, what would the resultant uh, implications be for the for the energy system 
Um, and the, the benefits are that you can eliminate some of the downstream emissions that uh, Tain talked about and that results when the uh, molecules of oil and gas in the products are released via some uh, form of use or disposal uh, technique. Um, and the other thing is that uh, fossil fuels theoretically via these pathways can be removed from the sector altogether. Um, firstly, we looked at a bioenergy only pathway um, and we, this entails producing ammonia, and methylene, methanol and ethylene directly from biomass. Uh, ethylene, in ethylene's case, this would be from bioethanol, uh, with propylene and aromatics being produced via methanol to olefins and methanol to aromatic processes. Second, we looked at an electricity-only pathway, which entails producing ammonia uh, and methanol directly via electrolysis, and then olefins and aromatics, all olefins and aromatics via methanol, via MTO and MTA. Uh, the results are stark. Uh, by 2050, the bioenergy pathway requires nearly eight times the bioenergy demand for all industry in a similar low-carbon pathway. In the electricity pathway, the demand for electricity exceeds that for all industry by 25%, again, in a similar low-carbon pathway by 2050. This is significant as a, industry is a large electricity consumer, as you know. These figures are all even higher when chemicals produced in refineries are included, uh, as in such a world, it is questionable as to whether refineries would be playing exactly the same role. There are other challenges with these pathways, such as increased water demand uh, and where the carbon source comes from for the electricity pathway um, for, for methanol, but this is uh, explored in more detail in the, in the report. I would like to finish by describing the um, uh, the policy uh, recommendations that we came to in the CTS, the top 10 among our various policy aspects that we discussed in the report, um, because the CTS won't come, by, uh, come about by itself, and it will need support from a variety of stakeholders across the value chain. We've divided our policy recommendations into two categories. Firstly, those related to the production of chemicals, and secondly, those related to the use and disposal of chemical products. And so the first recommendation that you have here um, is associated with production, and it's to directly stimulate R&D uh, of sustainable chem chemical production routes and limit associated risks with these, uh, with these R&D projects. Um, as an example, this would be providing direct research funding or providing low interest loans for demonstration products, uh, pro uh, projection, uh, sorry, projects, um, and making the environment generally lower risk to carry out uh, new ideas, investigate new ideas. The second is to encourage robust benchmarking schemes for energy performance and emissions. And the remaining three relate to uh, recommendations that apply to the energy system more broadly. Uh, pursue effect pursuing effective uh, regulatory actions to limit CO2 emissions, um, regulating and enforcing stringent air policy standards, uh, and elimin eliminating mechanisms that skew the market value of fuels, including those that fail to represent externalities. The second set of policy recommendations, second five of our top 10, um, relate to the use and disposal phases of chemical products. So they are firstly to reduce our reliance on single-use plastics other than for non-substitutable functions, um, improve waste management practices around the world, raise consumer awareness, consumer awareness about the multiple benefits of recycling, and encourage designers to build better products that take into account the disposal phase of the product of, at the end of its life. And finally, pursue schemes that extend producer responsibility uh, beyond the production site. And with that, I'd like to hand back to our director, Mech Tild, uh, to close the presentation. Thank you, and thank you all. I think you had a chance to get the main features and the main analytical work explained in the slides and by the colleagues. So let me just summarize and maybe draw some conclusions of that, what we call the blind spots, uh, and shining some light on that blind spot, which I think is a really very important and well done work. So first of all, uh, petrochemical products are deeply embedded in our everyday lives. They will also play a key role in many components of the energy transition, like on wind turbines and solar and others. 
So they have a key role to play uh, also in the future. Secondly, as a second conclusion, petrochemicals are the largest driver of global oil consumption in the future, accounting for more than a third of the growth to 2030 and nearly half to 2050. The main players in that game are the China, the United States, and the Middle East, who are leading the growth in the petrochemicals production. And as you also saw as one of the conclusion, the production, use, and disposal of chemicals take an environmental toll, but achievable and cost-effective steps can be taken to make these more sustainable. And I think that was well explained in the scenario, in the sustainable scenario. And my last conclusion is that analysis of these energy blind spots goes hand in hand with the IEA general policy on opening its doors to global engagement. So there will be more to come after we already had a look at the trucks, air conditioners, modern bioenergy, and now the petrochemical, which is a key, key one. So more will come. With that, I think we can conclude our uh, presentation and we have 15 minutes left if you have any questions and the team is here to hopefully can answer all of the questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michelle and uh, Peter and Legend. Um, so now the, the floor is open for questions. We're receiving questions through the, through the webinar software, so feel free to send those. We'll try to address uh, all of this in the remaining time that we have. And uh, in any case, uh, all of those get recorded and we will be able to respond back to you by email if we run out of time. Um, I just wanted to, re to, um, to inform you as well that this session is being recorded, so we'll, we'll make it available on the website as well, together with the rest of materials uh, related to the, to the report. Um, on the IA website, uh, since uh, this midnight, you could find uh, the press release, the main report, and uh, some, uh, I mean, ex extracts as, as the executive summary and some of the, uh, some visual information on the key findings as well. Uh, the executive summary is available also in Chinese and Arabic um, uh, for, for stakeholders to consult this. And uh, from today onwards, we'll start um, a roadshow and a, let's say, a dissemination program to visit different regions um, and engage with stakeholders um, around, uh, around the world as much as we can, uh, ranging from government, industries, and also research associations. So, Please uh, contact us if you are interested um, in learning more about this, this roadshow and if there are opportunities that uh, you think uh, would be worth uh, while exploring beyond what we have already planned. Um, with, with that, I may just uh, start responding to some of the, of the questions. Um, one, the first one we've received was related to um, the use of CO2 uh, for uh, urea. So the question was, when utilizing waste CO2 for urea production, did you consider the end-use emissions where the CO2 eventually is emitted anyway? It is important uh, distinction in CO2 account, um, accountability. Um, so, so yes, uh, we, we explore this area. There is a specific section in the report looking at um, downstream emissions from the chemical sector, and especially on this uh, value chain that uh, it was mentioned, so how uh, some of the emissions uh, generated in the ammonia production are used as uh, feedstock for urea production, which then leads into some um, uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers that when they are uh, used and hydrated in the agriculture sector, then um, as a consequence that CO2 gets released back. So there's some uh, there's little information on that and discussion in the report. Uh, in terms of accountability, uh, certainly we take that into account at the energy system level. Um, when we have reported figures today around the CO2 emissions uh, related to the chemical sector, we were referring to scope one or direct CO2 emissions, and that those would exclude those CO2 emissions, for instance, that would be released in the, uh, in the use phase of, of these products, but certainly those are accounted in the whole uh, let's say, uh, context at the system level. Um, okay. okay. 
One in the chart showing the cost of uh, bed can production, um, MTO, methanol to olefin based, uh, was shown as a cheaper than naphtha based chemicals. Does this take into account the cost of converting coal or natural gas into methanol as well? So on, on that uh, question, the, the assumption about the feedstock is uh, the average price for methanol uh, bought at the merchant, uh, merchant methanol um, purchased that year uh, and used as a feedstock directly. So it wouldn't be the capex of the, of the methanol plant or anything like that that's included, just the, the end price, market price for methanol. Great. Um, um, next question, um, given massive problems uh, with disposal, would incineration um, with energy recovery be a better option than landfill or other uncontrolled disposal options? Uh, uh, certainly, yes. Uh, we have an extensive discussion as well in the report around different uh, disposal um, options for, for plastic waste. And uh, certainly the trend that we see in uh, countries that are putting a bit more attention towards that, moving towards uh, greater uh, recycling um, and more uh, use of this plastic waste for energy recovery and trying to minimize and reduce as much as possible, even ban in some cases, uh, landfilling um, as, as an alternative. So certainly uh, that's, that's the case as well in, in our, uh, as a result of our analysis too. And we've had a query to clarify, um, or just go into a bit more detail on the graph on slide 34. Um, and this, uh, so just to go by bar by bar on this graph, on the 2017 dark blue bar on the furthest left of the diagram, we have the uh, current feedstock and, uh, sorry, we have the feedstock and process energy consumption of the chemical sector provided by fossil fuels today. Um, and then we, all, uh, in 2017, for the bioenergy pathway and electricity pathway, this would be satisfying the same demand, uh, but either via solely via bioenergy or via electricity. And, and this would be, sorry, including process energy consumption. Um, the dashed bars above each uh, of the colored bars, orange and green bars, show, uh, add in the requirement for producing all the chemicals that are projected to be produced in refineries, um, which uh, the propylene and BTX that currently comes from refineries, we project a portion of that will continue to be provided by refineries. And so these dash bars uh, show the additional energy requirements that would be required in each pathway um, were, were these scenarios to, to, uh, to take place. Now, the reason why do, we do that is because we see a world in which um, you know, in, in this scenario, if fossil fuels will be to be completely phased out of being used as feedstocks, then it would be unlikely that refineries would be operating in the same way. I should stress that although this um, graph takes its uh, production projections from the CTS, uh, from the clean technology scenario, it is not part of the CTS. This is a side uh, variant analysis that we did, a, a what if question, if you like. Uh, there's another question around, uh, well, mentioning what do the bars, uh, sorry, that one, on the graph showing the various regions and the pr uh, production of petrochemicals and feedstock demand, how did you explain that feedstock demand is lower than production? Um, so I think uh, in this case, uh, it may be, oh, yeah, I think um, the feedstock have been shown in, in MTOE units where uh, primary chemical production has been shown in megatons. So the, the units are not comparable directly. Um, and I mean, that may be part of the, of the confusion uh, there. But uh, those are related to, I mean, are, are shown in, in different uh, units. Um, another question is around whether in electricity scenarios do we consider the cost of capturing CO2 um, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure if that question refers, perhaps, to the variant that uh, the what-if analysis that uh, Peter describes around uh, what would be the impact on electricity demand if primary chemical production is going to be uh, completely produced from uh, electrolyzed hydrogen. Um, in that case, uh, yeah, I mean, 
we basically uh, would assume in that type of assessment that that electricity uh, that would be demanded uh, should come from renewable or low carbon sources. Uh, so to make the full, let's say, um, uh, sustainable gain from that uh, process route compared to other to other alternatives. And possibly if, if the question is in reference to the CO2 that would be required as feedstock for methanol and for the methanol as an intermediate to olefins and aromatics, uh, then no, this, this CO2 would have to be captured in other sectors um, and it would have to be um, yeah, yeah, captured from other industrial sectors if they were if they were not decarbonized by that point. But the, we, we characterize in more detail the both the CO2 and water requirements that would be, be required along the, alongside these feedstock and process energy needs. Um, so we, uh, we can look at that uh, in more detail in the, in the report. Okay, thanks, Peter. So I think that there's no more questions coming in for the moment. Um, as I've mentioned, please feel free to get in touch uh, with us and send your questions around. We'll be happy to clarify those by email or by phone. And um, and yeah, I think uh, take the chance maybe to to close it at this point. To so thank you all for your for your participation and the support throughout the development of the project. Uh, for those that were, were involved and uh, to thank my colleagues as well and Michelle that kindly uh, participated in this webinar um, as well. So thanks everyone and uh, we hope to see you soon.